So first of all, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to participate in this year's Production Street Review. I don't know when the first one was, but I know it was late 90s, Steve? Lord, is that about right? 95. 95. Oh, so this is 20. The 20th anniversary. Oh, mercy. Well, that is that is quite an accomplishment in itself. Um, and perhaps we should have made a big deal about it. But uh, again, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to come here. And I just have a few things to, to say this morning uh, to get the ball rolling. Uh, first, not working. Oh, I don't know. Oh, thank you. thank you, Mary. Appreciate it. Okay, so this, a little bit of history, just a little bit. This is what the first production suite looked like in 1955. Um, Baroclinic, thermotropic, and barotropic models. Uh, very simple, um, but that was quite a long time ago for quite a few <laughs> And this is what it looks like today. And this is, this is quite a, uh, an engineering marvel in its own right, the fact that this uh, runs 24 by 7, 365. And of course, the, the broad scope that we have here at NSEP and really within NOAA for its foundation numerical guidance systems, and this doesn't take into account you know, the front end, all the observation systems, all the post-processing data quality control uh, and then on the back end, in terms of the dissemination of the information out to the, the field and the public at large and all the post-processing. So, you know, the point here is that our system has grown tremendously over the last 50 years. Uh, it is very complex, and there are many more requirements that are coming at us in some of the other disciplines that we didn't have to worry about before. Um, for example, we now have a on-demand tsunami modeling capability that runs uh, at uh, NSEP Central Operations. It's not on the, the supercomputer, but on the, um, on the IDP uh, on-demand. So we have a very broad range of, of modeling systems. And of course, we are at a time now that I think is unprecedented in the amount of resources that are being put towards the modeling enterprise within this agency. Uh, the WCOS system, the operational supercomputer, uh, we just upgraded it to a, about a 2.8 petaflop per cluster capability, two clusters of primary and a backup. And I think TO4 is now becoming available to the developers as we speak, and I believe the high-res window is the first modeling system that is scheduled to be moved over onto that component of W cost, and I believe that's to take place in January. So this has put a lot of, um, I think, of a lot of opportunity on NOAA in terms of its modeling enterprise. And along those lines, I just want to set up the, the, uh, the next speaker, Ricky Rood. Um, as the NSEP director, I have at my um, uh, good fortune to be able to exercise an external advisory committee that was formed back in 2008-2009. Uh, and over time, originally it was focused on the business practices of NSEP across all the centers. Uh, they generated about 236 recommendations in 2009, and NSEP completed, I think, 94% of those that were within their means to do so. And the UMAC, the UCAC and has evolved over time to become more strategic. And so, Based on all the attention on modeling that we've had in the last few years and the resources put towards it, I asked uh, that a subcommittee be formed, um, and the uh, subcommittee is the, mod the UCAC and Modeling Advisory Committee that was formed last year. We had a meeting here in August where all the model developers were asked to come in and only give a four-slide overview of what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, and then address some of the questions that were put forward by this committee. And I am pleased to say that the committee is going to deliver a report from that meeting based on findings and recommendations that should be out uh, perhaps later today. So we're looking forward to that report. And one of the key findings that I'll share with you, this is a preliminary finding, but I don't think it's changed is that we really, within this agency, need to focus more on evidence-driven decision-making. 
Um, I'll be honest with you from a weather service perspective, uh, the requirements process has not been very well defined in the past. Uh, we have now restructured our headquarters, we restructured the budget process, and we're now working towards defining a much more clear and concise requirements process for everything that we do within the weather service, and that will in part also include the modeling enterprise. So the reason I bring this up, and Ricky's going to touch more on this later, is that this is the current structure of the weather service headquarters and I know this is kind of a bureaucratic thing to show, but it's really important because we're going to be working under this, this structure. Uh, and what you see here, the green box is down at the bottom. Those are the integrated field structure. And that includes NSEP, includes the water center, includes the regions with all the WFOs, the RFCs, and the CWSUs. So that is the operational part of the agency. NSEP is in the field. We're not a headquarters function. And I say that just to be clear. We have operational requirements. And then I answer to John Murphy, who's the chief operating officer. Andy Stern is the head of the analyzed forecast and support office. And then the regional offices with their directors there, and Don Klein is the regional as uh, the water center director. And then on the other side of the house, the left side is the Office of Planning, Programming for Service Delivery. And those five portfolios over there, that's where the budgetary control lies, right? Science and technology and integration, that's Ming Ji, the director, and he's responsible for the entire EMC budget. Um, NCO, Central Operations, for example, is funded by Central Processing and the Office of Dissemination. The service centers are split between Analyzed Forecast and Support and STI, right? the R to O components of those service branches, the, the science part of those service centers are focused by STI. So they're funded about three to one AFS to STI. So we now have a well-defined budget structure where we can account for every dollar that comes into NSEP and where it goes and what it's for. And some may feel that's an oversight and perhaps an overburden, but in reality, this is gonna help us be a lot smarter in the way that we manage our resources. And that's why it was really important that the UMAC report come out at this point in time. And let me talk a little bit about the requirements process. So this is what headquarters looks like and how are we gonna make decisions. On this side of the diagram is the Mission Delivery Council. It's chaired by John Murphy, who is the COO and has voting members from the regional directors, the NSEP director, and the AFSO director. And this Mission Delivery Council is gonna be the place that's really responsible for soliciting, vetting, and validating requirements from the integrated field structure within the weather service and also validating requirements that come from outside of the weather service such as the FAA, for example. And then on the other side of the house is called the Portfolio Integration Council. And that's basically where all the budgeting and the planning resides, central processing, supercomputers, IT infrastructure, and of course, the science and technology and integration. That's led by Kevin Cooley on that side. And the way our requirements process work from a high level is that the Mission Delivery Council, through the 11 national programs within the Weather Service and the integrated field, would develop requirements across those programs that then would inform and be um, perhaps deliberated about in terms of funding requirements by the Portfolio Integration Council. And then the third piece of this is the Executive Council, which is led by the Director of the Weather Service, Louis Uccellini. So it's this trifecta of councils that in the end is gonna be responsible for the strategic evolution of the weather service. These didn't exist before April 1st of 2015. And if I sat here and told you that I really understood it clearly how this is gonna work, I'd be lying to you. We still have some work to go in terms of figuring out the requirements process itself, but I can say that over the last month and a half to two months, that's been our primary focus. And you're gonna find out more information about that as 
we revised the governance structure of the National Weather Service. And that's important because the Mission Delivery Council is also going to be soliciting requirements and numerical guidance systems. And that's where you come in. That's why this meeting is so important because when you talk later on this week during this meeting, you've got to look at what the requirements are that come from the integrated field. <clears throat> and that includes the national centers, it includes the WFOs, the regions, RHCs, and the CWSUs. And then our customers and stakeholders from outside the weather service. I'm not going to go into this, but this just shows that we really are thinking about the requirements process. And this is a slide that you can look at, and we're building documentation that will support this process. So I don't want to go into it any further here. And then just in closing, uh, before I hand it over to Ricky, you know, thoughts for this meeting. You know, I think we've made a lot of progress in the way that, that we approach modeling in the agency. Uh, so, you know, again, it's that integrated field structure. NSEP is part of the field. The national centers are part of the field. And then we have the national service programs that are located within the Analyzed Forecast and Support Office. And those 11 programs, winter, severe, hydrology, marine, tropical, and so on. They need to have strong leadership in developing requirements holistically across the integrated field. That's going to be their responsibility. It's not an individual's perspective, but an integrated perspective across the field. And then they're going to be held accountable for soliciting, integrating, vetting, and validating those requirements. Uh, in, in part for observations, whether it's numerical modeling, products and services, whatever it might be. And the key thing is that that will help inform what we do from a modeling perspective. And I've always got hung up on the difference between requirements and requests. We've got to really work towards defining requirements and avoid being reactionary and responsive to requests. This is a real important thing because there always have to be economic trade-offs that are made. And we try to satisfy all the field requirements to the best of our ability, but we're also asking the field to be a little more selective and strategic in the requirements that they're putting forward. And that's where the national program leads are going to come into play. And we're listening to what folks in the field are saying. And uh, I know you have some sessions on this. Hendrick has set it up quite well. But we know that the 30-day assessment from NCO at the end of a development cycle is not adequate. I've learned that by going out and talking to the SUS in um, Western Region, for example, Mick Hick meeting in Western Region, just the general feedback that we've gotten. And so we're going to propose some changes to the model implementation process that you're going to hear about in this meeting. So yeah, I really encourage everybody this week to think strategically. I know the model developers wanted to find requirements for their modeling systems. But that doesn't always work out too well. So rely on the integrated field structure to help you define the requirements, and then really the integrated field working with the model developers to identify solutions. And if we start to really execute at the national program level, we may find there's an awful lot of redundant requirements across all the national programs that we could satisfy with a common modeling strategy. And I think that's definitely going to be the case because the way we're going with the complexity of our requirements that keep getting piled onto us and all our all the external responses and requests that come in, we just can't sustain that anymore. And I, I'll be honest with you, you know, we're living large right now from a budget perspective. It may not seem like it, but we're living pretty darn large right now. We're able to travel, we got training, we've got a big supercomputer right now for operations like never before. However, I'll guarantee at times will get tight again. And it's really incumbent upon us to get an integrated modeling strategy across NOAA so that when times get tight and the budgets get tight and they're looking for places to cut resources, we hold up this integrated NOAA modeling strategy and say, look, here's our plan, here's why we're doing what we're doing, here's what it's going to cost, and why it's important to the national and global weather enterprise that's going to make it a lot more difficult to come at us. So an important part of the outcome of this meeting is to listen to what Ricky has to say with the UMAC. The UMAC is going to brief Dr. Sullivan at the AMS meeting next month. Dr. Sullivan, Vice Admiral Brown, Rick Spinrad, 
Craig McLean, Louis Uccellini, NOAA leadership is going to hear what they have to say. So this is your opportunity to be heard. So with that being said, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to come to this meeting. I'll be in um, mostly tomorrow and in Wednesday. And at this point in time, if there's a question or two, I can take it if Mike will allow me. If not, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thanks. Yeah, hang on just a second. Who are you? I could see you. I think I'm Steve Track oh, hey, today, Steve. at least. Hi, Bill. Um, are there a set of priorities that will govern the list of requirements? And if so, how are they come by? It, I think what you're going to find, yeah, we have to prioritize the requirements, right? Because the way we do it right now is that just if we select the list, right? That's the role of the MDC is to be much more strategic in looking at the requirements that come in. And then based on those, prioritize where, you know, where the priorities for the agency. So, yeah, they're going to be prioritized. And it's up to us to clearly articulate what the strategies are from the higher levels so everybody understands what those are. And it's, it's not just driven by the top. I think the field has a really strong understanding of where the gaps are right now. You know, high-resolution CONUS ensembles, right? We've been talking about that for a long time. Well, what's that really need to look like? And I think the field, you know, the national service centers, the WFOs, in cooperation with our colleagues at OAR and academia, have a lot of work to do to define what that's going to be. So it really does force us to think a little bit. It's almost like UMAC's an opportunity to take a step back and slow it down a little bit. Because operations, you know, you're always turning. So this helps us kind of just pick our head up a little bit and, and think. hope that answers you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Eric Baylor at NES to Star. Um, when we look at the strategic guidance coming out of Dr. Spinrad and Assistant Secretary Brown and Bamford, excuse me, <clears throat> um, they all focus on uh, numerical prediction as a high priority for NOAA. And if we look at the next generation strategic plan for NOAA, we have a research council that governs the research enterprise, and we have the NOAA Observing System Council that governs observing. We have nothing for environmental modeling enterprise. And what's going to be done to do that, to address that kind of issue, uh, to support the integration across knowing the assessment of uh, priorities and resources accordingly? Well, that's, that's an excellent observation. That's one of the reasons why I formed UMAC, um, because I am concerned that there's not a true champion for integrated environmental modeling across the agency at a high enough level. It's typically been in the LOs, all right? And that has not really allowed us to build, develop an integrated modeling strategy. So when things get tight, LOs make decisions to cut back. So I've been arguing, and the UMAC, I think, is going to recommend that NOAA put somebody at a very high level to champion the modeling enterprise. And whether it's done through the Science Advisory Board, I don't know, Eric. But that's one of the main reasons why the UMAC is formed, and I think that's going to be a major recommendation coming out of it. Yeah, you know, we've got, we've got working groups and committees all over the place. Um, and I don't know if that's the right answer. If you don't have leadership at the highest levels with authority and responsibility, then just another working group making up stuff is not going to be adequate, in my opinion. Okay, with that um, timely, qu timely question, let's, let's get on to our next speaker, which is uh, Richard Rood, who's going to talk about... Uh, uh, UCACN and, and UMAC. Um, thank you, Richard. Okay, first, uh, th thanks for this opportunity. Um, this has been a, a, an interesting um, project that, that we're working on that has been keeping um, a couple of people up, uh, uh, particularly Fred and myself, 
uh, quite late at night, and, and the last email I, I have from Fred Carr is at 4.38 a.m. this morning on, on this. Um, so um, what I'm going to do today is to give a very quick overview, and then I will be here all day. Um, um, to, to talk about the recommendations. The report um, was communicated at 4.38 this morning um, to Bill Quo, who is our official communicator, who will be communicating it to NSEP uh, later today. Um, so first, um, this is the membership of the committee. I'm not going to go through everybody but I know that people like to see who's on the committee in order to be able to identify, um, you know, the, the, the expertise level and, and, and uh, who they can call to, to blame um, when they have issues. Um, the report structure, um, very quickly, there's an executive summary which we feel as if will be the most read page of the report. Um, then there's an introduction, and then there are overarching findings and recommendations. And then for each of the um, five areas that we decided to organize around, global, regional, water-related ensembles, um, reanalysis, reforecast, and I'm a little bit bewildered here because this screen next to me keeps okay. flashing on and off. Well, it just keeps going off. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll stand back in the class and play and look there. Um, that each one of these three sections um, has, a, has an introduction, their own overarching recommendations and findings, and then a set of specific recommendations. And many of those specific recommendations and these sub-themes are quite um, concrete and, and regard or, or focus on particular systems. Then there's a, a section, Bill talked about requirements, Bill talked about strategy. Um, there's a section called NCEPT is an end-to-end -end system, um, which is our attempt to define some of these sort of organizational and some of these sort of project management um, requirements that we see um, are um, as perhaps a model to, um, to really get to a, a new type of organization and their appendices. So I, I point this out. That's the structure of the report as a whole. I think there are about 70 pages of it. And we recognize that people will cherry pick and, and look through it, but, but there's your over, overview. Timing, on November the 20th, um, a draft was released to NSEP for fact checking. Um, and the official release um, is hopefully today. We were hoping to get it yesterday, um, but there were many comments, and every comment that was provided by that fact-checking exercise was considered. Um, we apologize in advance um, for um, if we did not completely address them in a way that you would like, and we also officially recognize that, that, that our committee lacks some expertise um, to, to comment as much as perhaps people would like us to on the particular subject areas. So, um, this is from the overarching findings and recommendations, and I think that this is an important point, um, which is we note that the mission here um, is unusual in many aspects. Uh, no other um, peer organization has chosen to separate the basic research and development um, from the applied and the operational part in the way that's been done here. Uh, no other organization, none of your peers, um, has produced such the diversity of prediction systems. Um, frequently, we feel without a critical mass of resources to make them world best. And no other prediction service sort of lacks the top-level oversight spanning uh, the research to apply development. So there are some organizational issues um, that um, are intrinsic and have been around and um, perhaps could be traced by a good um, organizational social scientist to the history and the evolution of the organization. Um, 
That said, we feel as if, as Bill said, that this is a moment where you're resource rich and there have been a lot of people doing a lot of things to address these issues. And that the key finding and one of the things that we put out in front uh, is that the environmental prediction has the potential to rapidly progress at this point to world leadership. Um, but it requires this new level of organization and as Bill has already said, it requires more aggressive use of what we, we have called evidence-driven decision-making. And things like that new level of organization and what we mean by evidence-driven decision-making are the sorts of things that are sitting in that section five. Um, I've already received a, a picture of a book from somebody in NSEP that's named evidence-driven decision-making, sort of saying, well, what do you guys mean? Um, so, so we have made an attempt to answer sort of the how here associated with this. Um, these are straight from the document. These are the bold overarching requirements and, and, and recommendations. And Peter Neely um, wrote me, he's on the committee this morning, that if it was his sort of elevator speech is the sort of first bullet or two, the, the, the imperative to reduce the complexity of the insect production. Um, the second one here is again, um, and it's repeated throughout the report, this need for evidence-driven approach towards decision making. And the idea that this evidence driven decision making needs to be across the organization, across the portfolio of products, across all aspects of the operational system from data acquisition to post processing. It's not just about the model. And one of the things we talk about is trying to put the products out in front, not models. Um, there needs to be a unified collaborative strategy for model development across NOAA. Um, we feel as if there is this need for an effective planning and execution that there needs to be a position that we've called chief scientist uh, for numerical, environmental, and weather prediction. Um, I have been in organizations where such an entity has been created and it's not an easy thing to do to make that an effective role that has the clout and sort of the, the intellectual breadth and the integration that's needed. Um, so this, this person is needed, but it, it's a position that needs to be brought into the true management and strategy and have sort of a long-term persistence um, that will require some management diligence to make that work. Um, NOAA needs to better leverage the capabilities of the external community. Uh, the complexity is increasing. Um, Tony Hollingsworth used to always say to me that the European Center did well because of its ability to leverage the research community in the United States. And that's what NSEP needs to do. NOAA must continue to enhance its high performance computing capabilities. Uh, it needs Whoever logged to in, please have sort your of, phone. Again, a persistent and strategic approach um, to management and acquisition of the high performance computing. Um, NOAA must develop a comprehensive and detailed vision document and strategic plan that lays out the future development of the national environmental prediction capabilities. And it must execute this plan and implementation plan based on stakeholder requirements. And we have a recommendation and a discussion of requirements management and the idea that requirements need to be accumulated and then reconciled um, across the agency and across NSEP, um, at least at a certain level, so that you can manage the resources um, collectively. I've now made an attempt of, to, to sort of give a couple of unifying things. The future will require moving to more unified systems. Um, 
the future will require addressing increasing scientific and data complexity. The future will rely more broadly and more effectively on community research and assets. We also discussed within the committee this need for balanced evidence-driven decision-making that optimizes stakeholder requirements, scientific excellence, and cost. And what we see right now is that much of the, much is driven by this sort of model requirements that are often coming from the developer or, or sort of paraphrasing what Bill has said to me a number of times, uh, conversations in the hallway, and that these things are not looked at holistically. So I've now attempted, and I've put my name here because I have attempted here to go through each of those five sections and pull out what I would think would be the one theme that I would stand up in front of this organization and say today. So from the global section, I think um, what I pull out of that is that the efforts associated with the NDGPS, the Next Generation Global Prediction System, and NIMS are very encouraging as scientific software and management advances. Um, organizational focus needs to unite on these efforts. Data assimilation needs to be incorporated into these efforts more convincingly. And GFS and existing global systems need to have a phase out plan to support NGGPS becoming operational. Within the regional part, the message that, that I looked at and took away is that this is the part where there is daunting complexity that is not scientifically justified. There is a need to eliminate systems, and we do make some specific recommendations about the systems that we feel should be eliminated. We also, in that systems part, describe a process on how to eliminate systems, whether it's the right way or not. Um, we were asked to make suggestions on how to do that. Um, we see a need to integrate better with global modeling because the global modeling is advancing to the point that it can perhaps do the job of some of the systems in the regional. And it needs a vision of unified systems, a goal of something like convective resolving U.S. ensembles, and it needs a lot more attention to software management. After those two, I want to make a quick statement about air quality dispersion and space weather. The panel felt as if we were not properly staffed to address the technical questions posed by these um, particular efforts. Um, we, we do endorse the way the space weather is integrated into NGGPS. Um, we noted in the comments that air quality and dispersion requirements needed to be integrated more into NGGPS and the atmospheric systems. Um, and we note that the community design and review for the air quality, and I could not actually separate if that also covered the dispersion model, was a successful model of practice that perhaps other parts of the organization could, should consider that sort of community uh, approach there. In what we did on water, um, the message that I took away again from our recommendations is that the multi-organizational demands um, across NOS, the water center, and INSEP, and the weather service required more management attention. Um, we were especially concerned about the requirements and the resource demands from the evolving water center and the need for far more attention on the definition of the requirements and the integration of that with NSEF, uh, central operations, and with EMC. And again, with regard to successful models of community engagement, uh, we highlight uh, Wave Watch. And then on the ensemble's part, um, INSEP should consider consolidated ensemble prediction under unified dynamical cores using physically based stochastic parameterization to treat model uncertainty in the ensemble. Again, a need to better integrate with global because of the possibility of some of those uh, requirements being met with global. And 
I think an important point is scientific progress is more likely to be made through robust investigation and a well-managed system in a controlled environment than through bringing in lots of models, lots of algorithms, and model diversity. Uh, the section on the reanalysis part, my highlight, the decisions on what computational and storage resources are allocated to reanalysis and reforecast needs to be done in a systematic manner based on how they help NOAA meet its requirements. Um, <clears throat> reanalysis and reforecast has become an integral part of NCEPT uh, mission and should be resourced accordingly, not on what appears to be an ad hoc basis. Needs more management design and uniformity in the grids used um, in order to um, get to the stakeholder requirements um, and to improve the interface uh, with stakeholders. Um, this is particularly with regard, with regard to post-processing and how information is presented. Um, in the systems part, UMAC calls for a high level, a new level of organization and evidence-driven decision making. And what this section does is an analysis and a description of the possible meaning of these organizational recommendations. And there's quite a bit of discussion of project management, software management, and organizational governance and their importance. And that if these issues are not dress, addressed, the current set of having too many systems, the current um, sort of fragmentation is only going to become unmanageable as the necessary complexity in data systems and science increases. And in the short term, and we realize that some of these things are already being done, um, the UMAC found it very hard to identify the complete range of products and systems, found it even harder to identify and publicize the leads for all of these systems this sort of information needs to be collected and presented in a uniform way publicly. Um, software is what you build. Uh, we need more software expertise, uh, identified software leads with proven expertise in scientific software, which does offer its challenges. It's important to develop change review boards. Yes, um, Important, we feel, to move to software release schedules for major systems and ultimately to replace all the code that EMC uses with code developed under software, um, formalized software management. Um, we feel that these sorts of tasks are needed quickly in order to get a handle on the current complexity that needs to be managed and reduced. So my final remark, um, what's in bold there is a quote uh, from the report, but it's also from Louis Uccellini, um, that, that in order to achieve a transformation to a science-based service organization directed toward building a weather-ready nation, requires a new type of organization which is more unified, better able to participate as a member of community, recognize and manage complexity, requires commitment and commitment from leadership, requires buy-in from the entire organization, and this will be a transition of years, not simply responding to reports such as this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Could we have the lights here? Hendrick. Uh, Hendrik Tolman, uh, I work here. Uh, <laughs> uh, the chief scientist position that you mentioned, at what level does UMAC think that needs to be? Is that a NCEP EMC, a NOAA weather service? I think I always hate treading into bureaucratic structures. Um, if you look at the scope of the models that we looked at, it would suggest it needs to be at the NOAA level because it, it goes across organizations that are above the weather service that are above NSEP. Um, an issue I have seen in other organizations who have done that is that that position 
if put at that level, sort of gets absorbed into high-level management as a consulting or an advisory role or a coordinating role. And what we need is something that is actually more diligently focused on strategic management and implementation. But it needs to be at that level from just a purely bureaucratic perspective. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I should just start with you, I guess. Yes. Um, what you're listing as things to do, if not requirements, looks to be a pretty long list without priorities. And I'm wondering first whether or not to do all of that, let alone even a relatively small part of it, uh, question being, does EMC NCEP have the resources to deal with those items? So I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. Um, first, um, if you look at the concrete recommendations in the subsection, some of them are prioritized. That we say we need to do these soon. Um, the, the second thing I'll say, and I see Steve Lord sitting there. Um, I was I was Steve Lord, were the first co-directors of the Joint Center of Satellite Data Assimilation, and I remember going to Steve's office and him presenting to me 222 requirements and said, we need to prioritize these and we have no algorithm for doing it. And, and so I think that one of the things that comes across in the systems and the management section is that there needs to be an internal process of that prioritization based upon those stakeholder requirements. And I would say with regard to resources, if you don't figure out how to do that, you will not have the resources to deal with that flat spectrum of requirements. It's mandatory. I think the word is in there, existential, in order to do that and continue to deal with the growing complexity that's coming in this field. If you don't mind to add to that, um, in terms of uh, prioritizing the, the, the practical the bits and pieces that go into the systems, that, that is a hard question, but I think in terms of re reforming EMC, reforming the production suite, we cannot afford not to do all the things as soon as possible because we're completely running, running ourselves into the wall with not having the resources to do the complex patchwork now. But just one to add on to that. It's not just EMC. It's not just NSA. OAR has quite a large modeling portfolio. I would argue they spend a lot more resources on modeling than we do in the weather service. EMC's annual budget is like, you know, base weather service is like 15 mil. Okay, and then pro programmatically throw in a nine on top of that that comes to weather service. So it really is corporate, and it's across NOS, OAR, NESIS funds an awful lot of NWP that never sees a lot of day of operational implementation. So you know that's why we corporately have to get on top. There's a lot of money right now. To be just not as organized. We're just not getting enough out of it that we need to. Well, I think given the attention on modeling right now in this country, if we don't hit it right now, we're, we're going to be, it's not going to be good in the future. We've got an opportunity here. Well, this will hopefully wake people up to get better coordinated. The, the, the days of continuing on as we want to do we just can't sustain that anymore. And I think there's changes at the leadership level now, Sullivan, Louis, McLean, Volts, they get this, all right? So now finally, we might have enough leadership to pull this all together and really bring this thing up to the next level. I'm really optimistic about that. Okay, and with that, we'll go on to the next, uh, next talk by Hendrik Tolman. Uh, I'll say my little um, soapbox is uh, an unbroken chain from research all the way to operation. So that, that's kind of where that fits. So, Hendrik, I'll thank you. Thanks. Uh, pretty uh, real small. Good luck. Um, I'll, uh, th three very small things organizationally. First of all, uh, we do have this whole three days ABIP presentation, which has not always been here. Thanks, Dave Michaud and his folks for making sure they're always here. Uh, secondly, thank you, Bill, for saying nice words about me organizing this, but it's really Jeff Manneken who was uh, running uh, most of the organization, so kudos to him. 
And Tom Cuff, are you in here? Stand up for a sec. Newest NSEP director, Tom Cuff from OPC. If you haven't seen him yet, uh, today is a, the next few days is a great time to see him. Okay, okay so um, I walk in a little bit late. This is not because I got the UMAC report at 4.38 in the morning. Uh, I had some issues with a kid in the school bus, but that's typical. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about moving forward. Um, okay, the UMAC report is coming out right now, but we have these discussions uh, since August, before August, and uh, at least on the strategic level, uh, Bill and I and a few others are very much very happy with coming out of the UMAC report because a lot of the things that Ricky is telling is things that we've already seen, and that we we love to see the confirmation of of, of some of these bits and pieces, and we're working on that. So uh, what I'm going to show is. Um, uh, first few slides are going to be really quick. Uh, you have to realize, though, that the production suite may be complex, but everybody says make it less complex, and oh, by the way, add all my stuff. So, and then the other issue is um, uh, you've got to be much more agile in changing the production suite, but by the way, don't change my model because I just got used to it. So it, it's, it's a really funny, funny place to be. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, UMAC findings and interpretation, which is from just before, but uh, as you saw, uh, before the official report, but uh, I had the chance to read the official report. And I'm going to show a few things about where we could go with the production suite. So this is very clearly where we could go. This is a first cut that's starting to think strategically. Nothing is cast in stone. We will start talking much, much more over the next few months now the UMAC report is out with our uh, end users, with the people in-house on where we can go and where we should go. But I would be, uh, would be uh, uh, not correct if I didn't show the fact that we have been thinking quite a bit of this already. So, seen this one, complex enough. Seen that one, just remember that that's only the top of the iceberg to begin with. And this is just the patchwork that is too much. So, where are we gonna go? Uh, simplify and unify uh, the, the model suite. So this is not uh, Ricky take one, this is Hendrik take zero. Um, the lack of the requirement process, that is very clearly uh, identified before. End-to-end uh, -end management, evidence-driven decision. And uh, one of the things that is really going to be a big impact for us at EMC and for NCEP as a whole and for all of NOAA is that the jigsaw puzzle that we've been using for 20 years, having a preset relative uh, allocation of resources of different systems on the machine, is something that is going to disappear. We are going to do much more strategically deciding what kind of resources we need and can justify for individual systems. And it's not going to be a, okay, the easiest way of managing it is the machine gets two and a half times bigger, all the, all the resources can be two and a half times bigger. And if you want to see Hendrik's take on what, what UMAC really has uh, um, uh, basically uh, justified in my mind as being the real reason, the reason why the production suite is so complicated is because we have continuously been implementing solutions. We've never been looking at real requirements in an integrated way. And so what we really need to do is we need, instead of uh, con uh, considering individual solutions for individual problems, do exactly one of the things that Ricky already uh, wrote in some of his slides, we need to go uh, to, a, to a reasonable uh, set of products and then map our requirements to it. And um, other way of looking at that, uh, some of this is, uh, is a little bit duplicated from the previous slide, but particularly we need to map requirements to products, not to models. And by the way, I wrote this before Ricky wrote his slides this morning, so uh, show you that we have been talking quite a bit already. Uh, we need to uh, uh, be much more targeted in where we do our model development. Uh, other, other thing that Ricky was saying, uh, we have a tendency of having the scientists uh, decide what's going on because of the things that they think is good in science. We don't look. That's good because those people are our people are some of the best in the world. Uh, our partners are some of the best in the world. But we're sort of missing the fact that uh, we do need to link that to requirements, not just to uh, the quote-unquote hobbies of the of the scientists. And uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be derogatory at all because uh, the, the strength and the hobbies of the scientists is what brings us forward. But the requirements is what should really guide us where we put our efforts. And then um, the business case is an integral part of our decisions. Um, yes, we want to do a unified modeling because we would do, want to do a unified model to simplify the production suite. We do not want to do a unified model for the sake of unified modeling. It has to be the balance between uh, the most unified type of system with the best possible 
um, uh, servicing of requirements for the best possible cost. And that does not mean that unified modeling means we are going to have one unified model no matter what. It means we're going to simplify all our systems all over the place. And then the additional considerations really are um, the fact that cobalt modeling is also something that comes up uh, much more to the front. Uh, we are uh, no longer looking at an individual weather, ice, wave, land, uh, aerosol world. We are realizing that the only way to do real sustained improvement of all of these is to look at that as an uh, integrated environmental system, and that is a view that's really carried worldwide. Uh, it's also the fact that uh, uh, we're really going away from this one deterministic model. That we really need to look at predictability, model uncertainty, and these kind of things. And so ensemble uh, approaches, reanalysis, and reforecast are things that are the year to stay. Uh, the interesting thing that happened this year is that with all of our interactions with the water center, uh, it is not just one reanalysis and reforecast we're looking on anymore. Uh, Reforecasting the analysis to recalibrate our models is a relatively cheap thing to do. Reforecasting the analysis in order to do full validation of a model and to do full decision support is a much more expensive thing to do. It's one of the things that we learned from, uh, from our partners in the Water Center. And this is something that we'll have to tackle a little bit more in detail uh, over the next uh, few years. Yes. So, basic approach, where would we go? So, let's just look at the atmosphere first because we are the weather service. So starting with, pro with products, there are in products by definition, they are defined by how far you look forward. Uh, they are defined uh, with uh, how far you look forward, what kind of run cadence you have, and what makes sense in terms of update, ci update cycles. A climate model you don't want to change every six months. A climate model that goes forward a year does not have to run every 15 minutes. Um, a climate model uh, does not have to... Um, to uh, uh, or has to do a very big uh, reforecast with it. What is not clear is what kind of resolutions you would use, how the data simulation works, and what the details of the reforecast of the analysis are. And again, we need to map these to the forecast. So a picture you could come up with fairly easily is what kind of ranges you have. You have a, a range of a year, which is typically what the, uh, what the seasonal forecasting needs. You have a range of a month, uh, especially the week three and four push that we're getting from the White House right now. You have the range of about a week, which is, uh, I, I tend to call the actionable weather, but that's probably not the best term for it. Then you have the, the range of about a day, which is the confection resolving part. Then you have the range of an hour, which is the warm forecast uh, paradigm that we want to go to. And then, oh, by the way, we do also a bunch of analysis for analysis purposes, not for modeling. So that ends up with, uh, with these different uh, ranges, with these different uh, actual time ranges, and you can ask yourself what kind of cadence you run these things on. Week, month, and year, we all run on a six-hour cadence right now. But do you really need to do that? You have to ask yourself that question. And uh, the reason why the one-on forecast box is red is because there's a lot of talk going on on that, but there's no development yet, and that, that could probably be a really big uh, resource requirement. So in terms of coupling, well, coupling is not just a science. Coupling is a very practical engineering thing. And for one thing, uh, just looking at uh, coupling uh, 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 makes sense if we know that we already have to run an ocean model, we have to run a, a, a wave model, we have to run a land model, we have to run an ice model from very well-defined... East winds around five knots, uh, becoming salt in the morning. Level. And so if you just do one-way coupling, if instead of running one model first, putting everything on disk, and then run the next model, actually run these models into a single system, there are some potential benefits. Uh, the one that is the strongest and is always overlooked is that if you have a one-way coupled system where, a, for instance, a wave model and, an, and a weather model run together, it's not that expensive to have uh, a forcing change every 15 minutes. Now we do it every one to three hours. Just simply the more accurate forcing you get by better time resolution already gets your downstream models in most cases much more accurate. Um, also, if you run these things coupled, uh, once I'm going to run my retrospectives with the system, I run a retrospectives of everything. I don't have to do first my one set, get all the data, then three months for the next set, get more and more outside of the range of the microphone. It also gives us less implementations uh, because we do uh, one single implementation for a Weather model, ocean model, land model, ice model, aerosol model, uh, which is the one I missed. I thought I said ice, but okay. Um, and it, it creates an environment 
where once you do the one-way coupling, the two-way coupling becomes from an engineering perspective really easy. And so you can do science, and the science shows you better stuff. It's not that hard to do. Of course, there's negative parts to it too. The, implement, the implementation themselves will become significantly more complex. You'll be less uh, less uh, uh, flexible to tailor products. For instance, uh, right now I'm running a, a wave model only uh, uh, eight days ahead. I don't have requirements beyond that. In a coupled system, I might have to run that 16 days ahead and, and just basically use some more compute cycles for that. And that basically means that in some cases, compared to, uh, to the requirements I have, I may, may be uh, getting into a situation where I create a little bit more than I, than I might need. So where are we right now? The reality is that we already have products of uh, the land, ocean, ice, waves, aerosols, and uh, even uh, on the space weather side almost, uh, we already have a lot of products that, that fit in all these different ranges. Although green-wise are places where we are already producing uh, uh, of these other systems uh, uh, products in the same ranges that I just identified for the weather. All the red S's or the R's are places where science has shown us that it's actually making sense to do it, and in some cases there are actually uh, uh, unmet requirements. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, on terms of the day ocean coast, uh, there are clear unmet requirements of coastal inundation on that time scale. Uh, we don't know exactly where that needs to go on the hourly scale. Space weather is developing a little bit, so I put a lot of blue question marks in there, but the point is, all the other environmental models already have needs and requirements in the same ranges. If you go a bit further, uh, see where the coupling is already there. So this, to explain this chart, so you have these, four, these uh, six major systems influencing uh, the same six systems. So this is uh, autocorrelation, this black. So the atmosphere already does land, ocean, ice, waves, aerosols in a one-way indirect manner. And uh, we already have, in a two-way coupling in the climate system, this. All these red boxes are places where science already has shown that there are clear benefits in certain cases. So, so it's not longer a question um, uh, if it's really worthwhile doing coupling. It's a question of what kind of coupling do you want to do. And so in the DA, we have a similar issue, situation. We really would like to unify on GSI on ensemble, ensemble hybrid 40 bar. So the global focus is really going to be the question, can you do that with one system, or do you want to have frozen systems for climate or not? That's, that's an unanswered question. On the regional side, it is, uh, yeah, we do want to unify, but how do we unify all our data simulation? What are we going to do with uh, convection uh, uh, results? Uh, we've got some really great progress with the HER, but if you look at the DA system, it is nowhere near as science-based as uh, what we do on the global side. And on the weather and forecast side, we have many efforts, but none of them are really linked to what we're doing in the product uh, suite right now. So that is something that we need to tackle aggressively in the next uh, few, uh, few uh, uh, months and years. So going forward, this is a work in progress. Um, let me just go forward to this thing. This is just a, a look at where we are right now. So take these year, month, week, day, hour, and, and now cast. Look at which models we have. So the seasonal is unified. It's one model for we see in four, the CFS is the only one that does it, but we're talking about extending the gaps. Where it gets really crowded is on the week time scale and on the day time scale, and on the hour time scale, we just have a red box, we have nothing yet. So is there room for unifying? Well, if you do this as a global ensemble, this as a global ensemble, you could tentatively, looking at the CFS, the STREF, the, the, the RED, and the NAM, all have almost the same resolution. So you could think of unification by global ensemble, global ensemble, global ensemble at that same resolution, and you may be able to, to, to fold a whole bunch of these different models into a single model. On the convection resolving side, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're, we're building that, and we're building that at the moment with a two-model system with the understanding that we need that right now because we right now still need diversity in cores, but we hope in the next two or three or five years to go to a fully single model uh, thing there too. I don't have that much more time. Just to give you an idea, just as an example, uh, you can do the same thing for all these other models too, and uh, yes, uh, people in uh, EMC, yes, people in our, in our, uh, uh, our uh, partner site, I'm going to send these kind of slides to you and ask you to populate these over the next few weeks because uh, we need to do that. And we need to realize that you cannot always uh, uh, do everything. For instance, tsunami doesn't fit at all in this system. Um, 
Then uh, we also have a big issue in uh, in the ocean side that we have two and three D approaches that are mixed. The other thing which is a big issue is the fact that analysis and nowcast is done partially by a different brands of AFS. We need to make sure that we really coordinate between AFS and NSAF and all that kind of uh, modeling. And this is a uh, a slide that Louis made on the back of a napkin in, uh, a few months back, and he made it to do a real slide. So the other thing is that we need to do requirements and metrics. Uh, so uh, we really need to map all our requirements, all our metrics, to, uh, to these specific forecast and product ranges. Uh, I believe Jeff Craven already started something like that with the Google page on uh, for the regions. I really appreciate that. Um, and we need to talk to all our key stakeholders. And so as soon as I have the other set of slides and the mapping of the, of the month to hour done, uh, we will go back over the next few months to all our uh, um, uh, stakeholders to get that. And we're already practically doing that. So there's a lot of gas implementation. We've noticed that the gas is starting to be used to compare with weather. That becomes a different set of metrics and, uh, and uh, uh, requirements coming out of it. So, I've been told by uh, Mike already a few times that I'm over time, so I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Hendrik. Um, okay, we have some time for questions. Broader overview. Steve. Please, please mention your name. Steve Traxon. Um, two questions, somewhat related. Um, you I've heard that the phrase evidence-driven decision several times um, in the in context of the, the box we're talking about the daily forecast of the different models, SREF, uh, GFS, et cetera, et cetera. Are you of a mind or is EMC of a mind to go in the direction of developing a unified model or are you going to build a unified model, test it, and use whatever comes out of the results of that to determine where you focus attention. At this moment, we're at a level that it's clear that there's much too much traffic in that box. Uh, we haven't made a decision yet on how we're going to get rid of that traffic. One of the options is to to uh, uh, to try and unify them one step at a time, and the other option is to look at uh, building a GFS ensemble at the same native GFS resolution. Uh, on a on a on a science side, and see if you can do that quickly in terms of being able to replace the stress and then in the rep. At this moment, that picture is my view, and I need to vet that much more with the rest of the community. But tentatively, I would like to see us going into into a uh, a, uh, a global 10 kilometer resolution ensemble system that that covers all these models. How to get there? This is my my view, I'm not going to be the dictator here. I need to work that out with all the EMC staff, all the NSAP staff, all the, uh, all the uh, stakeholders. But the nice thing is, with the UMAC report, we have a very clear mandate to try and do something like this. Uh, second, you uh, talk about map requirements. I want to map the requirements to product. Now, which level of product are you talking about? Those which come directly out of EMC, NSAP, or products? that field now has uh, the, the products that the field distributes? And are you talking about the existing set of products or ideas for new products and how to map those? Short answer, yes. Uh, the whole, what, what you tell, what, what the, one of the things that you mentioned in terms of uh, do you talk about the products that the field uses because they get it from somewhere else? This is exactly the problem. We are getting solutions in forms of products, rather than actually requirements that we can actually work with from, from the ground up. That process of a individual scientist going to Louis to say, hey, I've got this great idea, should we implement that? That's what we need to get away from. Because as long as we allow that to happen, there is no way to keep the complexity of a production suite under control. Okay, thank you. Um, time for one Last quick question as our next speaker goes up to the stage. Yeah, Hendrik, Mike Farrow, MDL. A real quick question on re-forecast, re-analysis. Uh, earlier, Richard Root, he kind of showed what their priorities were for it. You and I have talked about this 
and we both, you know, in principle agree that, you know, the reanalysis and reforecast needs to be part of the whole process. It's scheduled in. Uh, hasn't really happened yet. I know we're trying. Uh, is your intent when we bring on the new uh, W cost, when we get that huge bump up, at that point, will it be brought into the operational system, or are we still going to be trying to juggle it on the research systems? So if you had asked me that question a year ago, I would have said yes. Uh, after our, all the discussions we've had with the, with the National Water say, Center, I say yes, but. Uh, we've started to identify two structurally different reasons for doing a reforecast. The one is for the calibration of the existing ensembles. The other is for the full validation and the full decision support. The only thing that we had planned for, not mm -hmm. realized that we did that uh, a year ago, in Tom Hamill's white paper is really the calibration reforecast. The calibration reforecast, if you prorate the cost of that, that down there. To running an operational system, mm -hmm. is order of 50% of the cost. Please make sure right. you have muted your phone. That is a small enough Thank cost you. with a big enough payoff that I am willing to blanketly say, yes, we need to do that. The validation that the water center was asking for was uh, the reforecast was much bigger. Originally, I balked at that. I say, why don't you fit in Tom's? of the world, realizing now that that is a completely different need, different rationale for doing that bigger reforecast, uh, we have to figure out what to do with those. The reforecast that the water center wants, and that probably everybody wants when they figure out what the water center is trying to do with it, is uh, an order of magnitude more expensive than the calibration reforecast. So now you're talking about investing three to five times in reforecast and reanalysis compute costs compared to what you do for real operations. And that is a decision I don't want to say yes to yet. And that is a, a situation where uh, between the water center and EMC and ASRO, uh, so uh, um, uh, Ernie and uh, Tom and me particularly have been talking about that. We believe that in order to be able to commit to the full validation reforecast, we need to start doing that way more smart. Because the, the high resolution reforecast is needed to get the extreme events. That's now done by brute force by having a high resolution sampling. Uh, uh, particularly Tom and I think that, that if we get some time, we can, we can design a validation uh, reforecast that is significantly smaller. And if we can do that, then we would commit to that full time too. The first part I think uh, is a no brainer. Thank you, Hendrik. Uh, our next talk is uh, by BJ Telebergata, uh, the chief for the Global Climate and Weather Modeling Branch. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll. Okay. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is my first time here as the chief of uh, the Global Branch. And I know I'm under the gun, so don't shoot me yet. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll uh, try to cover. Uh, some of the aspects have not read the report yet from UMAC and have, uh, have been in discussions with uh, several people on the unification aspect. So I will touch on that. Uh, especially I wanted to focus on two aspects. One is what we are going to do in the next uh, few months. And uh, I will highlight uh, one of those, the new model upgrade evaluation strategy that, that Bill mentioned in his opening uh, talk. Uh, things are changing here in terms of how we evaluate our models. So that would be one of my um, discussion topics and also the plans for 2016 onwards. Um, so before going into too much detail, this is what we are going to do. The next GFS will be uh, up upgraded uh, in spring 2016 with a 4D hybrid ensemble system as a major upgrade from the current 3D ensemble system. Uh, there are a lot of things that uh, include in this uh, upgrade package. Uh, majority of them are related to the data assimilation and observations. And also one uh, important uh, upgrade was to correct the two meter temperature biases that we have noticed there. So uh, for those who want to know the details, you can go back and read those slides, but majority of them are uh, also include the all sky radiance data assimilation and the forecast model changes include corrections to the land surface temperature uh, land surface characteristics to reduce the summertime warm and dry biases over the greater plains, and uh, also plan to produce hourly output. Again, I don't know if it's a requirement or a request, but that certainly is being accommodated uh, 
in, in the new package. Uh, a few uh, illustrations on how the temperature, ch uh, the changes to the grassland and cropland characteristics uh, have resulted in reducing the bias for both uh, temperature and dew point at two meters, and that resulted in a huge significant improvement uh, in both uh, the, all the two meter fields. Uh, majority of them are in the Great Plains, Midwest, Southeast, both in bias as well as the RMSLs, and some improvement also noted in the Northeast, not so much elsewhere. So this is something that I think is a, uh, is a right response to the request from the field to pay attention to these issues in our global system. Now, the biggest challenge is to do the retrospective to meet the requirements here of all the evaluation centers. If you look at this uh, column here, this talks about how many simultaneous parallels that we are running right now to accelerate the testing and evaluation so that we can implement it on time. It's all given by the timing here with a possible uh, implementation in uh, April or May 2016. So uh, the point here is involving the field in real time and retrospective evaluation as, as these uh, runs are going on and identify the case studies uh, and uh, complete the evaluation before we go for a decision briefing uh, to implement this change. So do not wait until the last minute. Like the last 30-day 30, 30 parallels from NCO are only going to do uh, IT test rather than a scientific evaluation. So that's the driving force here. So we are rather <clears throat> extremely busy Upgrading uh, the computer resources as well as uh, human resources to do all these runs on the field. Uh, the field has uh, responded on what they wanted to look at, and these are the list of things that we were asked to evaluate. I mean, uh, these are some of them are standard practice, but some of them are new. Um, so, for instance, we are uh, extensively doing the tropical cyclogenesis verification apart from the uh, track and intensity and uh, the synoptic and daily precip verifications, uh, continuity objective score, the CAPE, the retrospectives uh, are evaluated for the standard verification and also uh, against stone analysis, fit to off, the GTO, and uh, also the field, uh, the centers have come up with uh, various case studies that need to be extensively evaluated uh, comparing the new model against the current operational system. And so we uh, put together a lot of uh, results uh, in various links shown here. More links will be made available. There are now new pages coming up with uh, the plumes, for instance, uh, from uh, uh, from the recent work done by Jacob, and also a lot of uh, buffer sounding verification and uh, other evaluation metrics that will be shown in these links that were presented. So the summary of uh, the evaluation so far, EMC has been responding quickly to the problems reported by the field. Uh, the new GFS, significant improvement over the current operational for short range. We are still evaluating as the runs are going on. The hurricane tracks are a concern, especially at day six and day seven. Uh, we saw a significant degradation from the earlier efforts from both GFS and the ensemble. The cyclogenesis is now being added to an extensive verification, a lot to assess, and also need to engage community at the same time. And uh, uh, fortunately, MDL early evaluation indicated that no harm done uh, with this upgrade, so there is no need for immediate recalibration of the MOS equation. So uh, apart from uh, the global model upgrade, I just wanted to briefly touch base on what else is going on in the global model. Uh, global modeling branch here, as many of you know, the ensemble system has been upgraded uh, to version 11 last week uh, on second. The CFS will be uh, slated for updates for the GSI implementation probably in January, February timeframe. The VAM, I think it's on track uh, on the research side. The NGAC is also slated for improvement uh, coming up in the quarter two, and uh, the GFS in the spring. So uh, this is uh, just uh, one slide from Eugene Zhu on, on the upgrades for the ensemble system. Um, it has added about nine hours of skill. It takes about 10 years to just add one day, so it's a significant improvement in that sense. 
although uh, there were some issues noted for other fields. And uh, uh, we will be working on integrating the gaps into the GFS as we move forward into the unified system. Uh, this slide is from Suru about the CFS V2.2. Uh, the major improvement is in the upgrades to the data assimilation components so that it supports the maintenance and serviceability of the current operational CFS for the next five years. Uh, plans for 2017, that's the immediate goal. And this is the, uh, this is the start of an era of uh, applying the unification into uh, the operations through the use of NEMS for the global model. So the NEMS transitions will be planned for 2017 with a, with a possible 10 kilometer upgrade to the horizontal resolution and either 64 or 128 levels in the vertical with uh, possible physics options here, the simplified higher order closures, the shock scheme, the prognostic PKE, unified deep convection parameterization for the scale aware components, improved interactions for the cloud and uh, radiation, and the Morrison double moment cloud microphysics scheme are potential candidates. Uh, this uses the unified new uh, interoperable physics driver if possible, if, if that becomes uh, available for us. This is an active uh, area of development that's going on right now. So some early results are uh, showing significant value of uh, the resolution as well as the new physics changes. This is with the current operational physics. This is with the new physics for hurricane sandy simulations. Just to illustrate that the work is going on at a rapid pace. So this one you might have, uh, I mean, Hendrik did not show this, but I can illustrate this as a, as a new phase of uh, the global coupled system. We have the NEMS ESMS controlling all these individual components. The physics is separated from the dynamics. The aerosols, the DA, the land, ocean waves, and sea ice all become components. And uh, it's all based on the modular modeling using ESMS and also a fully coupled uh, system that includes the ionosphere ecosystem. Uh, in the initial stage, we are focusing only on the atmospheric model with its uh, uh, physics component. And uh, so, uh, as many of you are aware of, the, ne the next generation global prediction system uh, project is uh, going uh, in the second stage of testing. And uh, these are the candidate models from several centers, including EMC. And we, um, we came down to two models the NCAR MPAS and the GFDL FV3 models as potential candidates to replace the spectral dynamic core with uh, either of these models' dynamic core. And people wanted to know what the schedule is. Uh, the drop deadline to finalize the dation is uh, uh, given by the program office as 1st of July 2016. And uh, this talks about when to freeze uh, the GFM uh, or the current GFS uh, um, the development will retire or uh, freeze the development and then move on to a new dynamic core implementation, which is potentially uh, happening in the time frame of uh, October 2019 or shortly thereafter. Uh, so this is a five-year plan to replace the current operational system, and I think we are making good progress there. And uh, believe me, it's a lot of work to make everything uh, work as designed. The physics is the major part of it. The New Opsi physics driver, this is already uh, an initial version has been delivered for testing for the individual die course. Uh, this follows the modified Kalne rules so that each component can be individually developed and an interface will interact with the model dynamics without having to re retune everything whenever we change something. And this is a, a this is kind of a development that we need that falls into the software management and uh, adaptability that Ricky has mentioned in his recommendation. Uh, the GEFS will fold it into uh, the same framework, the NEMS GFS. It will share the same components, so it becomes uh, an easy pathway to implement uh, the global model upgrade either together or uh, in a systematic way, both the the deterministic model as well as the ensembles, and eventually the climate forecast system as well. Uh, the science, which, which will also be part of the new opsi physics uh, driver that I mentioned, will include uh, the stochastic physics components that will help um, with the ensemble perturbation. 
the NGAC is another version that we are upgrading next month uh, in quarter two. And uh, eventually this will, this is the first implementation of the NAMS. This will also fold up into the unified system that helps uh, connecting the aerosols with the atmosphere and other aspects of it. So uh, I'll take more time to uh, answer any questions from here onwards. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Um, so let's see if we can have the lights. We'll see if there's any questions right now. Note that if anything else comes to mind, we do have the Ask the Branch Chiefs um, tomorrow as well, where you can put Jeff Domago and Bob Grumbine and VJ on the spot. Here we go. Um, VJ, Bill Ward, um, Pacific Region. I'm just kind of curious. The um, Himawari has been up there running for a year now. How much of that data is getting assimilated into the model? Well, uh, John Derber has a talk on the data assimilation, and I will let him answer the question. But uh, for this implementation, we are not using Himawari. None. Oh, sorry, thought I heard you. Right. Steve. This question is actually probably best addressed to you, Andrew. Um, especially when you're looking at the longer term outlooks beyond three years, is what you have scheduled compatible with a decision if it's made to go with a unified model at any time? Or do you have to back step and start from not from scratch, but some from earlier position? This, this is specifically planned to go to a unified system. See, it's, it, it, it's not compatible with it. It is planned to get there. The, the, whole, the, the real uh, key on the practical side there is what uh, Fiji mentioned is that we really have to do all the engineering work, uh, which may not be that sexy, but the engineering work to really go to the NEMS version of the GSM. As soon as we go to the NEMS version of the GSM, the plan in the NGGPS is to make the other course, NEMS course also. So it allows us to, to, uh, to just uh, exchange course. Of course, there's always much more work, but it allows you to exchange course rather than bringing a whole new model in. And, and the, the new core will be the basis of the unified system. So, so this is a, a, a already integrated planning towards going to a unified system. With the biggest change, you go unified, just an increase in resolution. I would just, excuse me. I would assume you'd have to modify the physics, etc. The, the, the putting putting a new core in place for a unified system is not because we believe that the core holds the science keys to getting a better model, but because we believe that uh, a well-designed core uh, that allows us to be both uh, non-hydrostatic and hydrostatic uh, positions us best to use the computer resources that are coming up. The real benefit uh, of uh, unified modeling we see coming is in being able to do a scale-aware uh, single physics package, which uh, we should start doing what we've ignored the last few years and put way, way more attention on the physics. And one of the things that I know is on, on, on our mind, but that Fiji didn't have on his, uh, on his uh, thing is, uh, for instance, uh, the, the, all the boundary layer physics. That we, there's a lot of work that we can do on that still. Dan. Thanks, VJ. Uh, I saw you had the Morrison double moment microphysics on your list for 2017 there. What are your thoughts about consolidating the aerosols completely within the uh, GFS, GFS also, with aerosols, including uh, aerosol cloud condensation nuclei within the extension to Morrison and so on, doing this all together, including fire uh, input to that? What are your thoughts about that possibility? Well, that, that's a good question. You know, the initial efforts are going to uh, focus on the atmospheric application, and then as the next uh, extension is obviously merging the chemistry part as well. And it's, uh, it's not set in stone. The so Morrison is only one option. So uh, as we find, uh, as, as many people mentioned, evidence-based decisions here in terms of how uh, 
the aerosols interact with uh, our physics and improve the atmospheric forecast. Based on that, decision will be taken. But yes, that's in the plan of uh, extending the number of tracers as well as uh, moving the chemistry as an integral part of the physics. Uh, good morning. Uh, Peter Neely from the Weather Company and also a member of UMAC and UMAC in as well. Um, actually, just two comments. Uh, one is um, the question of what evidence-based decision-making means um, has come up, and, and admittedly there is some vagueness in that. But in our report, we specifically mentioned the NGGPS process as a great example of evidence-based decision-making, and we need to bring that discipline throughout the rest of, uh, of the enterprise. Uh, the second thing I want to retort, what I thought I heard Hedrick say here a minute ago was um, the, the real advantage that the Mackin saw to the unified model was um, that it provides a simplified um, uh, 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 paradigm for the organization so that it can focus on having world-class science in a narrower set of, por of narrow portfolio rather than a broad portfolio that has pretty good science. Thank you. Um, uh, actually, there'll be plenty more time for discussion. Um, and right now, we will take a coffee break and come back and start at 11 sharp. Thank you.